What's up everybody? This is Squiggy with the Music Experience and Loudwire's Gear Factor. I am hanging out with the living legend, the, the guy that has literally inspired me since, since Bring the Noise, man. It let little hip-hop kids know that it was okay to be hip-hop and metal. Mr. Scott Ian, dude, thank you so much. Is it okay to be hip-hop and metal? I, you know, man, I, I, I was the kid, man. Break dancing with a Motley Crue shirt on. I, I, I mean, right that on. was me, man. And, and I got to tell you, man, you were... I didn't know it was never not okay. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear it's okay now. Before you were Scott Ian, the guitar player, before you were a guitar player, what was the riff that made you want to pick up the guitar? Uh, it wasn't even a riff. It was just Pete Townsend doing a windmill. Yeah. Like this. Yeah, it wasn't even a riff. It was just seeing him on television doing that with his arm and I, I thought it looked really cool and uh, it made me want to get guitar lessons. Yeah? Yeah. When, when you started playing guitar, what was the first riff you learned? What was the first song you learned? Could have been like either Wipeout or Blowing in the Wind. Those were pretty early on. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what is your favorite anthrax riff that you know you want kind of on your on your tombstone like 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 scott ian wrote this riff i wrote the war dance riff in indians i guess i'm pretty proud of of that part it was almost a riff that i did because i liked the way it looked because <laughs> when it goes uh this part the I just like the symmetrical <laughs> of that. And it just looked good when I played it. And I said, it just seems goofy, though, that a little bit, the chromatic bits. And um, yeah, I didn't think much of it at the time. I knew we needed a bridge because Charlie wrote the main verse riff in that song and the intro, you know, the, that stuff. And uh, but we needed a bridge, and I, I had come up with that part, saying, well, this is like I, we used to call it back then, we call it like the mosh part. And uh, and I said, I got this riff. It feels like a really heavy mosh part. And then, of course, once we jammed it as a band, it didn't feel weird or goofy to me anymore. Right. Obviously, we started grooving on it. But no, initially, when I wrote that, I, I didn't know it was going to become what it was. The March of the S.O.D., on the other hand, I kind of knew when I went bomb, 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 I was like, that's pretty fucking heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How, how important was it when you were coming up with your signature model for it to be a production guitar? Um, like, obviously, there's there's a lot of signature guitars that are only custom shop, you know? Six, seven thousand yeah. dollar guitars. How, how important was it for you to have a, a guitar that was purchasable? By I started doing that ages ago, having a production model. Because, yeah, not everyone's running out and buying a a really expensive, you know, as a custom shop guitar. I, I understand that. So for me, it's always been important to have like what they call the mid price, mm -hmm. and uh, but have it be something that I would actually use. And you know, with with one of the good things about technology is to manufacture a mid price guitar these days. It's not some piece of shit. No, no, not at all. Like the my mid price V. Uh, I play them on stage. Strictly from a, a, a functional point of view, I can walk on stage, plug that mid-price into my rig, and play any song, and I do it. I have them on tour with me, and I do it. So um, it kind of blows my mind that because of technology now, uh, they're able to just take the specs off of this and, and just completely recreate it. I was listening to your podcast with Dean Del Rey, right? And uh, I, I love Dean's, uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I love his podcast. And um, the story of, of how Bring the Noise came, I, I didn't realize that you and Charlie kind of just jammed it out. You know, like you guys, you guys were in the studio, is that right? And drums were already set up and yes. you were like, dude, like let's jam this. And it was the end of uh, recording Persistence of Time. Yeah, Charlie had just finished tracking all the drums on that record, and uh, I just had the idea in my head. I had I, I had to work with Public Enemy somehow. I had to work with Chuck, and uh, I just had the idea for a riff, which basically just came off of the the horns that they sampled in their version of Bring the Noise is what basically 
inspired the riff, I almost feel like I was just kind of transposing the already existing horn part, mm -hmm. keeping the groove the same. And I just said, don't break down the drums yet. I have this idea. Yeah. Let's see if we can work it out. And, you know, I just went in and started going. So simple. That was it. And then that. Like two parts. Oh, and, I uh, love it. Yeah, and we just went in, in the room. I, I believe it was the three of us. It was me, Charlie, and Frankie. And uh, I just showed them the part, and we just started jamming on it. And I said, all right, that's a verse. That's the chorus. And, I, and we had the structure already because it's their song. Right, right. So we just we just kind of used the parts we, we came up with to fit into the spaces of their arrangement. And, and that was it. Dude, well, thank you so much for sticking to your guns, man. Dude, that was an amazing point and I think a lot of our history. Cool. So thank you so much, man. Cheers. Squiggy with Mr. Scott Ian. Thank you. Horns up.